During my recent break from YouTube, I took a look back over the videos I've made on this channel and noticed an unintentional bias towards media made by Japanese creators. Japan has been the leader in Asian horror for decades, gifting us classics such as Ring, Juwan, Resident Evil, Silent Hill, Fatal Frame, and many more. But East Asia has much more to offer when it comes to horror. My playthrough of Thailand's Home Sweet Home last year proved that Japan isn't the only country that can produce a good Asian horror experience. Putting aside all of its mechanical shortcomings, of course. So this time, it's Korea's turn to show what it can do. Korea, primarily known in the West for its particular styles of pop music and romantic drama shows, has actually overtaken Japan in recent years when it comes to horror cinema, at least in my opinion anyway. Where Japanese films seem to be moving towards more comedic, less serious attempts at horror, Korea has been quietly filling in the void left behind and satisfying the voracious appetites of 1990s and early 2000s J-horror fans. Films such as The Wailing, Gonjam Haunted Asylum, I Saw the Devil and The Call cement Korea as the new king of Asian horror films. Yet, when it comes to video games, Korea doesn't have as large an industry as Japan, especially when it comes to the horror genre. A quick internet search will show Korea is primarily a producer of multiplayer gaming experiences, some of which include Terra Online, Black Desert Online and PUBG. As for horror games, the only notable releases are The Coma 1 and 2, which are a series of side-scroller visual novels from 2015 and 2020 respectively, and White Day, A Labyrinth Named School, a 2001 game never officially released outside of Korea until it received a remake in 2017. White Day actually earned itself a cult following since its initial release, which resulted in an English fan patch being made so that more non-Korean speakers could play it. The growing popularity from this wider reach was definitely a big factor in the decision to then remake the game. The original game, although it reviewed quite well, sold poorly in Korea, resulting in it not being translated and ported internationally. It was praised for being very scary. So scary, in fact, that after player feedback, the developers implemented a patch that would split the game up into several different experiences based on the selected difficulty level. The lowest difficulty would provide less scares and more healing items, while the higher difficulties would do the opposite, as well as provide more story for the player to dig their teeth into. This means that if you want to experience everything White Day has to offer, you need to really challenge yourself. Another notable feature of the original game is its first person perspective, which was a rarity at the time. It also features 8 different endings that increased to 10 in the remake. The endings are achieved by completing certain criteria during a playthrough, such as choosing various dialogue options and whether or not you give items to characters at certain points. It's all very complex and not something you should worry about on a first playthrough. For any completionists out there though, there are plenty of guides to follow on the internet. All this makes White Day a fairly replayable game, which is a plus in any case. The remake also didn't change much from the 2001 version. It included a bit more content, increased texture resolutions, and added new audio including English voice acting, the quality of which is debatable. So with all that said, let's take a look at White Day A Labyrinth Named Schools Remake. The game opens with a very K-drama-esque cutscene, showing a boy approaching a girl intent on giving her a box of chocolates as a White Day gift. For the unaware, White Day is a holiday celebrated on March 14th in Japan, China and South Korea, and functions as a way for men to present chocolates to the ones they love, similar to Valentine's Day, where women do the same. Those who received Valentine's gifts are also expected to return the gesture on White Day. The girl reads her own diary on a school bench, and a somewhat sombre piano melody plays as the boy just tramples flower patches to reach her. A gust of wind blows a photo of her and another girl out of her hand, and she gives a solemn expression as he returns it to her. She then runs off to join her friend, leaving her diary behind. Fast forward to night time, where the boy, He Min Lee, returns to the school with the chocolates and diary in hand. His goal is to sneak into the school and place both items in So Young's locker for her to find the next day. It's kind of a contradiction of courage there, to be honest. I mean, he's brave enough to trespass on school property, but not enough to confess his love? Teenagers, am I right? Once inside, the shutter lowers behind him, trapping him inside the school. You gain control of he -min, and with what feels like each step you take into the first hall, you're bombarded with tutorial messages, most of which explain the most basic shit ever. It also doesn't help that they're accompanied by very loud guitar riff sound effects, which act as annoyingly pointless jump scares. After rifling through your immediate surroundings and collecting an array of random items, you hear what sounds like another person in an adjoining hallway. Inside, you find Sung-ah and Ji-hyun, who have also coincidentally snuck into the school tonight. 
Sung Ah questions why you've snuck in and you're given the option of two replies. This is actually how you'll interact with all the characters throughout the game, and I'm not super fond of visual novels, so I got a bit weary here, but thankfully it's not too common an occurrence for the rest of the game. She asks for your help with something. Well, it's more of a demand than a request really, and I wasn't getting good vibes from her so I chose to refuse. A choice that is immediately disregarded as you're forced to help her anyway. Again, a conflicting display of courage by Hee Min who will break into the school at night but won't say no to some sassy bitch he just met. Sung Ah reveals that she wants to retrieve her book from the home ec room and needs you to fetch a stepladder so you can crawl through the vents to unlock the door on the other side. Not sure why I have to go through all this when she could just borrow a classmate's book. I actually kept refusing her here but in the end I was still forced to help. I love dialogue options that present me with an illusion of choice. After some exploring, I begrudgingly brought her a stepladder and wire cutters, and after one last attempt to get her to do it herself, I gave up and entered the vent. In here, you spot a fellow student stumble out into the hallway before being brutally beaten and dragged away by one of the school janitors. Is this a big deal? Hell yes. Will it ever be presented as such to any authority figures or members of the police? Hell no. He Min's got more important things to do, like retrieving a book for a demanding stranger and giving affectionate chocolates to his crush in the most cowardly, unattractive way possible. As you drop down into the auto shop room, an alarm rings and a ritualistic symbol appears on the floor, both of which disappear after you find a metal token that looks similar to the symbol you saw on the ground. You meet up with Sung Ah again and she mentions how the school may be haunted before sending you on your way claiming she has something else to do before she leaves and then proceeds to stare out of the window. You now have access to a previously locked hallway that houses a bunch of classrooms, but the murderous janitor begins chase as soon as you enter. Thankfully though, Ji Hyun pulls Hee Min into a dark room, helping him to escape his pursuer. After a quick conversation where nothing of value was said, not even how the janitor is a murderous lunatic, she leaves to do whatever it is she came here to do. One thing that started to irritate me here is how awkward and unnatural the dialogue is. Our interactions with Sung Ah swing wildly between super flirty and super bitchy, which makes her seem very untrustworthy and undeserving of my help. Like I have a choice anyway. Then our conversation with Ji Hyun is filled with interactions that don't seem to naturally flow into each other. Like I try to warn her that the janitor is dangerous and she barely takes any notice of it but not in a way that makes her seem like she's the type of person to disregard warnings. It's done in a way that really doesn't make any sense in any kind of way. I don't know. It's unnatural and immersion breaking to the point where through the cracks I can see the developers pulling the strings so that you're forced to experience this on your own, because if anyone else were aware that they definitely needed to get the fuck out of the school right now, then they would do so and there wouldn't be a game. This twisting of logic to fit an unstable narrative instead of building a believable situation is downright lazy in my opinion. Anyway, in the hall outside you find a socket that the metal token fits into, unlocking the staircase to the floor above while simultaneously spawning another weird token barrier on the door to the other part of the school building. We know this is our next main objective since Sung Ah told us we could leave through there. After doing some exploring upstairs and filling your bag with more random items, you find So Young's classroom, but it's locked. Solving a couple of simple puzzles will grant you access to a new hallway upstairs where you'll encounter this. Now, this seems fairly spooky, but when doing my research for this video, I came across the same cutscene from the original game. And, well, see for yourself.
Now I'm not going to be comparing the two games a lot during this video because I haven't played the 2001 version yet, but the original cutscene is a lot scarier and atmospheric. Sure, it is a bit weird how the lighting seems to strike at evenly spaced intervals, but the presentation is a lot more effective than the rather flat version we get in the remake. I'm sure other people have gone more in depth when comparing the two scenes, so I won't bother here, but this seems to be par for the course regarding the remake's somewhat neutering of horror elements. I'll talk more about this later though. Returning to So Young's classroom, we find her actually exiting it. Confused by our presence, she questions why we two are in the school after hours. I chose to tell her I was returning her diary because that seems ultimately more important to her than forcing my love on her. Before the admittedly awkward conversation can progress any further though, she's pulled back into the room by tree branches, which then block it from the outside. In an anxiety inducing twist, you're then given a time limit to save her from whatever it is that has ensnared her. Luckily, she dropped a master key for many of the rooms in main building 1. During the 10 minutes you're given, you need to search all of the rooms and gather items that will help you defeat a tree monster in a classroom downstairs. The tree monster can only be harmed after destroying 5 weird looking plants that have started pulsating around the building. What makes this section difficult is not the time limit, but the puzzles you need to solve. Thus far in the game, the puzzles have been relatively easy, yet the one here that requires you to crack a safe using a code you get from matching the number of medals corresponding with certain dates in a specific order threw me through such a loop that I genuinely thought I was stupid. On my first attempt at this timed sequence, I had no idea what to do. I searched all the rooms and in doing so found several random items that I thought must have something to do with whatever puzzle the game told me I needed to solve in order to save So Young. I spent most of the 10 minutes trying to find some way of using the baseball cap and whiteboard magnets I'd found, completely unaware that they, much like many of the other items in this game, only have a use in higher difficulties, meaning their entire existence in normal mode is to confuse the player. This is fucking baffling game design. On my second attempt at solving this puzzle, because I straight up ran out of time before, I managed to solve the safe puzzle and acquired a chemical solvent which will destroy the weird plants, meaning I could use the same item on the weakened tree monster and kill it. I did this and, well, I'll let you see for yourself. That's right, I just got killed in the cutscene. Why? Well, during this attempt I hadn't bothered to acquire the bug spray since I assumed it was just another random item that had no use. There was no indication that I would even need this to solve the puzzle though because when the cutscene plays without it you don't get the quick time events and a moment where you would think, oh, I could probably use the bug spray with the lighter there to burn it and free myself from its grasp. You get no impression that it's even important, even when you die because you didn't acquire it. Genuinely baffling game design. I almost can't believe it. Anyway, after defeating the monster and returning to the room So Young was trapped in, only to find her gone and a wooden token left in her place, you encounter Sung Ah in the hall. She doesn't believe you regarding the tree monster and chastises you for being into So Young, even going so far as to try to spread rumours about her. I get nothing but bad vibes from this bitch. Thankfully, she's scared off by a ghostly laugh that echoes through the halls and we're given a choice to follow her or to check out the source of the noise. I chose the lesser of two evils and pursued the demonic laughter, which seems to have come from the hanged spectral corpse of a previous student. So Young soon enters the room with no recollection of what just happened to her, probably for the best. No one believes anything we tell them anyway. So Young seems to have knowledge of the school's supernatural qualities and hints that all the weird goings on may be due to a preordained event. She then takes off and leaves us to our own devices, pointing us in the direction of main building 2 if we want to leave, which we obviously do. We use the wooden token on the door to the other building and it lets us through. As soon as you enter, an infant-like spirit appears before fleeing down the hall with a shrill shriek. This building is much like the previous one, which can make things a little confusing later on. There's enough differences to distinguish the two usually, but when you're frustratedly trying to just solve a fucking puzzle to progress even slightly, they can blend a little together, making it difficult to keep track of what is in which room. After some exploration, you find yet another barrier on a door, which does exactly what you think it does, meaning we'll have to do exactly what you think we will. Finding the next token, however, will prove to be far more difficult than you'd expect. 
One puzzle you need to solve requires you to use your lighter in a darkened room to read hidden writing on a chalkboard that isn't visible under fluorescent light. Now, we'll ignore the fact that I wasted upwards of an hour trying to find a fluorescent light source to reveal the message due to me misreading the note as visible under fluorescent light. That's on me. The second half of the puzzle is where my frustration becomes a little more justified though. When revealed, the chalk message shows this. What does this mean? I don't read Korean, so I have no idea. A note on the board shows a collection of Korean or Japanese symbols? It looks more like Japanese. I'm fairly sure it's Japanese. Anyway, these symbols correspond to the numbers 1 to 10, although there are dashes between them and not equal signs, so I wasn't sure if those symbols were Japanese numbers or if that's just the order that they were in from 1 to 10. The puzzles in this game are often at least a little obtuse, but that's still nothing compared to what comes next. The way to solve this puzzle, which as far as I'm aware is not indicated anywhere in the game, is to subtract the symbol on the right from the symbol on the left. And no, I don't mean you need to somehow match the numbers on the note to their corresponding symbols and subtract them from the similar looking symbols on the board. Somehow. I mean you need to imagine the literal lines are gone and match what's left to the symbols they resemble on the note. Isn't that just fucking unfair? Imagine trying to do this whilst also having to deal with a murderous janitor roaming the halls not 10 feet away from you. Several times I was interrupted while trying to solve this and it just felt like the game was trying to punish me for playing it. You know what it's like? It's like trying to solve a Stoku puzzle but every 30 seconds you need to run away to hide in a bathroom. Then, by the time you return to the puzzle, you need to regain your bearings and even then you might not even have enough time to progress before you're chased away again. That's kind of what this game is like as a whole. It's a frustration simulator, or a masochism simulator, depending on your tastes. Anyway, solving this puzzle gives you the code to the principal's office. Inside, if you're more observant than me, who spent another hour trying to figure out how to progress, you'll find a small tile puzzle on the desk that rewards you with the videotape locked inside. I don't understand how you're supposed to solve this either. I thought you had to align the light or dark shapes so that they join across all four, but apparently you just need to have them all matching in a certain orientation. Again, loving these puzzles, man. They're just so intuitive. Once you grab the tape, a CCTV setup will reveal itself from behind the bookshelf. On one of the monitors, we see the janitor hide something atop a bookshelf. Inspecting the camera feed again will show the janitor noticing it watching him before running to the room you're in and banging on the door. Now, you would think, oh no, he's caught me for sure, wherever will I escape to? But he actually just goes right back to his patrol after this for some reason, even though he has clear evidence that there's someone watching him on the cameras inside this room. But anyway, moving on, I guess. <laughs> You retrieve the key he hid and So Young finds you. She mentions needing to find Ji Hyun and you follow her as she slowly makes her way upstairs to the faculty office, listening to her go on about various mysterious and possible paranormal occurrences in the school on the way. He Min then picks up an audio tape during a cutscene and Ji Hyun makes an appearance. Apparently she was lured here by So Young, which So Young has no knowledge of. Instead of staying with them while they talk about this obviously important revelation, So Young sends us off to find a way out of the new building. After some more puzzle solving, which you know I love, a giant baby erupts from within the art storeroom. This starts another timed segment which is a lot easier than the last, only requiring you to create a mother shaped clay doll to quell the child's rage, doing so gifts you with the earth token. You place it in its socket and the door opens, revealing So Young walking down the hall past it. How did she get there? No idea, and Sung Ah calls out to her from behind us but she doesn't respond. Very sketchy. You're given another choice whether to stay and talk to Sung Ah or to chase after So Young. I'm sure you can guess which one I picked. Through the door is a pitch black winding hallway that leads to the new building. Here you find So Young and converse with her. Annoyingly, you don't get the option to ask her how she got on the other side of a door that you had to go through so much to unlock. She joins you as you explore the new building, which is kinda nice actually. Well, until she decides she's too thirsty and tired to carry on, so you need to give her one of your precious soy milks. You also finally get the opportunity to return her diary here, which I did, but nothing interesting comes from it really. Continuing on, the new building is a little more interesting than the previous ones. Instead of requiring regular keys to unlock certain rooms, each room is assigned one of four colours and can only be unlocked if you have a keycard of the same colour. I like this as I think it's a good way to easily convey progression to the player. 
You can instantly tell which doors can be opened amongst the rest and when you find a keycard you know exactly which doors to use it on, unlike earlier when you acquire a master key that doesn't open all the doors. Before long, So Young finds the yellow keycard and upon picking it up, the school briefly shakes around them. This, I guess, is an indication that whatever paranormal event that's occurring in the school is growing more dangerous. The newly acquired keycard unlocks the door to the main hall and So Young spots a key dangling from an above walkway. She accurately assumes that it's the key to the roof and sends us on our way to retrieve it. This hall has a lot of classrooms throughout and also a new janitor that whistles while he patrols. This whistling is extremely useful as a method of determining his location because unlike the previous two buildings, this one has visible open verticality. If you can hear him whistling far away from you or even on the floor below you, you're fairly safe to go about your business, as long as you're crouching most of the time anyway. I should mention here though that despite having multiple floors to explore, the walkways mostly follow a linear structure, which makes escaping the janitor quite difficult since you can't easily loop around to a different side of a staircase or something. Also, the only place to hide from him in this building is the bathrooms, which are just beyond the entrance door, back the way you came. Meaning, whenever you get caught by the janitor, you need to retreat to this one spot, then wait until he leaves so that you can re-enter the hall and continue whatever you were doing. It's the same issue as earlier where you have only one method of losing him and constantly find yourself executing that method, except it's even more annoying here because it's literally the same hiding spot every time. I don't know about you, but if I were looking for someone and they kept disappearing after entering a bathroom, I'd check inside the only closed stall. Nothing about it makes sense and it's incredibly frustrating. The only thing that saves it, and I'm scraping the bottom of the barrel here, is that the hiding place is consistently successful. Anyway, sorry, rant over. Inside a classroom next to a token barrier is one of several extremely cool ghosts reminiscent of Laura from The Evil Within mixed with a bit of Sadako and a dash of the exorcist's Reagan. They crawl across the ceiling and will attack you if you try to enter the rooms they're in. I did try to see if I could lure them to one side of the room and enter from the other to quickly search for items, but they're much too quick and will catch you instantly. These rooms are basically off limits for now. A detail I like about them is that you can see the spider girls hanging from the ceiling from the window outside. It's really spooky and a fair warning not to try your luck. Eventually you'll enter a dance room with a mirrored wall, where a boss fight will suddenly take place against he mins evil reflection. The reflection will conjure fields of energy on your side that will hurt you, while he stays safe on his side. The only way to deal damage back is to match the speaker placements to that in the reflection, the existence of which I don't really understand. You do all this while the single most bizarre boss music I've ever heard plays in the background. To give you an idea of how unfitting it is, here's a sample. After breaking the mirrors with the power of resonance, the evil reflection seemingly dies and you can pass through to the other side where the red key card lies. In the library upstairs, you find Ji Hyun, who wakes up confused as to how she got there. She assumes we kidnapped her in order to do some heinous things and doesn't believe us when we assure her that we had no such intention. It also seems like she's been having a harder time than the others, like getting separated from them, then seeing creepy things and trying to rationalise how and why she was called here in the first place by someone she thought was so young, who, it's revealed, is here in search of her dead sister. I feel bad for Ji Hyun, she's going through a lot right now. Anyway, we leave her and continue on our way. There's a music appreciation room downstairs that has a tape recorder, a part of which you need to fix a different one so that you can play the audio cassette you found earlier. It is, however, guarded by a spirit that will instantly kill you if you don't have a yin yang token that you find at some point. I love unavoidable deaths for unexplained reasons. They're a perfect example of great and healthy game design. I'm joking by the way. So, with the yin yang token, you enter into a form of combat with the spirit, who will teleport around the room, requiring you to get up close and shine her with the token's light before she can charge up an attack. It's a tough fight, mostly because it's janky as fuck, but at least it's quick. With the drive belt you took from that tape player, you can repair the one in a different room and play the tape. What you hear is the voice of that girl, according to the music teacher Kim Ji-won that suddenly appears, which 
isn't exactly helpful or at all informative since I gathered on my own that it was indeed a voice from a girl. He gives you the blue keycard before leaving just as mysteriously as he appeared. Outside, you find So Young casually strolling down the hall, talking about her dead sister. She apparently died in the school and So Young is determined to uncover the truth behind the mysterious death. Fun fact, I actually accidentally skipped the rest of this cutscene and found myself instantly being chased by the janitor. What I skipped was So Young mentioning her sister getting into arguments with a friend over the phone shortly before she died. Then, the janitor walks by, chases So Young away and turns back to target He Min. That explains how I ended up getting chased, I guess. Once you've lost him, you can overload the power generator to blow the fuse on the lights, which knocks the roof keys to the ground. It's a pretty big logical leap to assume that this is the best way to retrieve the keys instead of maybe just reaching down from the platform, but whatever. I'm trying my best not to nitpick. I actually flipped the generator switch with the janitor hot on my trail, but after the cutscene he disappeared. Uh, sorry, sorry. No nitpicking. You can now access the roof, which is home to a large swimming pool. A ghostly mermaid swims around in it and she'll attack you if you fall in. Unfortunately for us, the architect who designed this school didn't think to leave enough space on the sides of the pool to cross over to the opposite door, meaning we'll need to find our way across an invisible path using some dousing rods we found earlier. Why is there an invisible path over a mermaid pool? No idea. The way this puzzle works is you need to walk forward when the rods point straight. If they cross each other, you'll need to reorient yourself to find where the path leads next. Also, an important thing to note, which took me an embarrassing amount of attempts to realise, is that when the mermaid swims near you, you need to stop moving, otherwise she'll drag you into the water. The reason I took so long to figure this out is because I assumed I was completely safe while on the invisible platform, thinking I was only in danger if I fell off it. And to be honest, it was challenging enough already trying to follow a winding invisible path without the added task of keeping constant track of the mermaid circling around me. So after reaching the other side, you drain the pool and with it the mermaid, allowing you to retrieve the water token from its floor. With this, you can unlock that barrier downstairs. As you attempt to leave through these doors, a distraught woman throws a knife at you from across the hall. The two janitors then come storming down the hall and she has flashbacks of when they denied her access into the school to save her daughter. She swiftly takes them out with a scream and turns her fury back to Hee Min, even though he doesn't deserve it. She sprints at him with her knife raised and you'll need to act quick to avoid her. It's not at all clear what you're meant to do in this moment, but you're supposed to run upstairs to the power switch and time it just right so that when she corners you, you can activate the security alarm at coincidentally the exact same moment that Sung Ah flips the power switch downstairs to disorient the woman, make her trip over the broken railing and fall several stories to her death. Again, another huge logical leap by the characters to assume that this would ever work. And that's not even the stupidest part though. That plan will only work if you've switched the fuse from a power box you used for an earlier puzzle so that the security alarm will even receive power. This is something only a person who knew exactly what would happen next would ever do. Meaning, the only way for these characters to get out of this situation successfully is to possess knowledge that there's literally no way of them having without a narrative reason for them being resurrected and retaining memories from previous lives, which there isn't. This is the most blatant example of bad puzzle design that a game can have in my opinion, and this moment was by far the most frustrating, insulting and immersion breaking in the game thus far. It's completely unacceptable, but I have to finish the video so we'll move on. For now. As the crazy woman lies on the ground with He Min standing above her triumphantly, Sung Ah emerges from the power room. She's shocked to see the dead woman, but brushes it off easily. A little too easily if you ask me. She sends us to the lecture hall to find So Young while she goes to find Ji Hyun. As we leave, a cutscene shows spectral orbs surrounding the body of the woman. I don't think we've seen the last of her. Inside the lecture hall, we can turn the lights on which reveals So Young lying on the stage below. There's also a note mentioning the placement of three fire extinguishers around this building. I wonder if that will be relevant soon. The instant you set foot onto the volleyball court, the place erupts with fire and the spirit of the crazy knife lady emerges from the flames, cackling maniacally. The same weird, ill-fitting music from the evil he min fight plays again here, as you need to gather the extinguishers to put out various fires around the building that block progress. It's a fairly simple puzzle, but the added challenge of the woman constantly pursuing you inside the hall makes it a bit more fun. 
Now I know I said I'd try not to nitpick earlier, but one thing that annoyed me during this segment is how close you need to stand to the fires to use the extinguishers on them. It took me a couple of deaths to even realise I could put out these fires because I never stood close enough to them for the prompt to appear. And I mean, can you blame me? Would you stand this close to a fire this big? This proximity wouldn't just singe your eyebrows off, it'd cook the entire front of your body. It's yet another example of something that feels like it wasn't playtested enough. Either that or the playtesters are third degree burn fetishistic masochists. Anyway, you put out the fires, performing a quick time event to dodge a Final Destination-esque accident each time and eventually turn a valve to activate the sprinkler system. This quenches the flames and also the fury of the crazed woman. She evaporates, leaving a fire token in her place. So Young awakens from a dream in which she sees her sister's soul trapped in this school. She then urges he min to free the rest of the souls trapped here and we leave her behind to do just that. As you place the fire token in its socket, a shockwave ripples through the building, releasing the trapped souls which take the form of twinkling white orbs. Before you can celebrate though, Sung Ah appears and reveals herself to be the big villain behind everything. The freed souls, which now resemble ghastly faces, are sucked into a black and white maze of Sung Ah's creation. She then gives a classic evil bad guy monologue and leaves you to die in the maze, but also leaves the tokens in here which we can remove to escape. It's like locking us in a jail cell and then throwing the key in there with us. While running through this maze, which resembles the school's layout, the phone calls between Na Young, Sung Ah and their mothers play out in the background. During this and the monologue Sung Ah gave a little earlier, we learned that Yeon Mai, the crazy knife lady, was Sung Ah's mother. She was clearly driven to insanity after Sung Ah burned to death in a fire in the school and never recovered. The reason Sung Ah was there to begin with was because she was waiting for her best friend and So Young's older sister, Na Young. Unfortunately, she died in the fire that broke out in the home ec room before Na Young could arrive. Sung Ah then began to haunt Na Young, driving her to suicide out of immense feelings of guilt. Na Young's soul was then trapped inside the school, which fed more power to Sung Ah, who acts as the master of the labyrinth. So, after removing all the tokens and reforming the seal to subdue the labyrinth, He Min finds himself on what looks like a platform made from Minecraft glass blocks. So Young lies unconscious at his feet, and Sung Ah on all fours some distance from him. She rises to her feet with a look of pure hatred on her face, but before she can attack, she's dragged down into the abyss by the spirit of Na Young. A fitting end for the once best friends. It happens quickly. So quick, in fact, that I must have blinked or something and missed Na Young grabbing her feet, meaning I thought that she just fell off the platform. There's just a seven second run to the light at the end of the platform, and you've escaped the labyrinth. And that's it. No final boss battle like I was expecting after finishing the maze puzzle. No final monologue or emotional clash of ideals. Just five seconds of a cutscene to finish off the boss. Pretty underwhelming. So Young wakes up on the ground outside the school and He Min reaches out to pull her up. They're finally out. Well, except until So Young remembers Ji Hyun exists and the two return to the school. But it's daytime now, so it shouldn't be that big a problem, right? Right? And that's the end of White Day, a labyrinth named school. I got the Ivy ending for anyone that's curious. I brushed over a few things throughout the story section so that it wouldn't get bogged down with details, but I did want to touch on some things here because I think the story and the characters were this game's best aspects. To start off, the reason the school is haunted to begin with is because it was the location of many horrific events throughout history. This gave the area bad feng shui, or maybe it was there to begin with, I'm not sure. Regardless, the place had bad vibes, and Kim ji Won, the mysterious music teacher, was tasked with balancing the feng shui by use of the elemental tokens. The tokens, however, had the side effect of trapping all spirits within the school grounds, which is why the place is so haunted. By placing the tokens in their sockets throughout the game, we unknowingly released the seal on the bad energy contained within, which allowed the master of the labyrinth, Song Ah, to reach her full powered state. Her goal was to manipulate He Min into removing the seal and then resurrect herself in So Young's body so that she could presumably leave the school and live again as a live human. I think, anyway. The story felt rich and there's a lot of elements that overlap and lead into each other nicely. For instance, the cause of the fire that killed Song Ah was Ji Won accidentally dropping the fire talisman, which was only created to contain the negative energy that Song Ah would eventually become trapped within. There's a lot of interesting relationships like that in this game, and if it weren't for how much I disliked gameplay, I would have no issue replaying it to explore more of the endings and content exclusive to higher difficulties. 
The characters are just as rich as the story they're enveloped in, and now while this is going to make me sound like a contrarian, I don't like how they're portrayed in the game. The acting in the cutscenes, both physical and vocal, is extremely awkward to the point where I'd rather it just be static screens with text-based dialogue interactions. The motion capture has many of the mannerisms commonly seen in Korean and Japanese media, especially anime, where the girls are overly cutesy and do these weird bending poses while talking. Paired with the American voice actors doing their best attempt at an anime girl impression and you get a weird, awkward tone that doesn't suit the horror setting. Unsurprisingly, the original Korean audio fits the scenes a lot better. I don't think I'm doing a great job of explaining it, but there's a definite disconnect between how the characters are portrayed and literally everything else going on around them. It doesn't help that the cutscenes themselves are terribly directed, each of them feeling unfinished, and what I think they're lacking is additional details or shots that could better convey the purpose of the cutscene. Putting aside their portrayal, the characters' stories were all interesting to watch unfold and they all had solid motivations, which is kind of important when you need to justify why so many people are trespassing in a school on the same night. One character I wish I saw more of was Ji Hyun. As we learned in my playthrough, she was lured to the school by who she thought was so young, but who was actually Sung Ah, who intended to use her to remove the talismans before changing her mind, deciding Hee Min would be better suited to the task due to Ji Hyun's timid nature. When you first encounter the two of them, you see Sung Ah trying to get Ji Hyun to find a way into the room that she makes you crawl through vents to reach, which is where you find the first talisman. Throughout the story, if you interact with Ji Hyun in basically the complete opposite way I did, she will replace So Young on the stage in the auditorium. A romance develops between Hee Min and Ji Hyun, and you can choose to give her the chocolates, which she gladly accepts. It's a lot nicer an ending than the one I got, especially since Hee Min's feelings were actually reciprocated. But then again, it's only one of ten endings. The rest vary depending on your choices throughout the game. I tend to only care about the ending I get in my first playthrough though, as that's the one that I got because of all the decisions I made, uninfluenced by ulterior motives, but I can understand other people wanting to explore the alternate realities. As I alluded to earlier, a lot of this game's content is locked behind the higher difficulty modes. Most importantly, and unfortunately for me, this includes a lot of the ghost encounters. Throughout the game you find many ghost story notes, each of which pertains to a ghost that can be encountered. Reading these is quite fun as they're all well written and usually provide the backstory to a ghost haunting the school or the events of people encountering ghosts already there. They often act as teasers for what might happen later or give you clues on how to find certain spirits. The ghosts, when encountered, will be collected as art cards with biographies describing their folklore. They're all really interesting and I'll include a link to the wiki in this video's description if you want to read through them yourself. The ones I encountered in my playthrough were all very memorable, in particular the locker lady and Na Young's spirit. There's another spirit that I encountered repeatedly, which resembles a disembodied head that slowly approaches you, but this one definitely lost its appeal after the second time it appeared. It just kind of floats at you from afar, and I wasn't aware that I could escape it or that it could possibly notify the janitor to my presence, so I ended up just walking at it most of the time, resulting in a quick but ineffective jump scare. And that's not exactly the reaction you want to garner from a player to something that's intended to scare them. The stories behind the ghosts are one of the best aspects of the game, and I really wish they'd been allowed more of a presence. At the start I read each one thoroughly, inspecting them for possible clues I might need later. After a while though I stopped reading them as they didn't seem to have a purpose outside of a few fringe occasions. I figured it wasn't worth the effort if I wasn't going to encounter the ghost anyway, so I began ignoring them. I wish the game did a better job of making these notes worthwhile to read and actually showing off all the well designed spirits with fascinating backstories, but it didn't. It's a bizarre decision to make a horror game and lock most of the best horror content behind difficulty modes that new players are most likely not going to select. Hard modes primarily exist to give returning players a more challenging experience so that the game has more to offer than just the same thing as the first time around. Imagine if Resident Evil 2 locked the dogs, liquors, and ivy enemies behind higher difficulties. Any new player would come away from a completed first playthrough thinking there was not much more to bioweapons than generic undead people. Now that brings me to White Day's main source of horror, if you could even call it that, the janitors. If you've ever played a clock tower game or even Alien Isolation, you'd have a fair idea of how this game would play. I myself am not a fan of the constant pursuer type games, 
Anyone who's watched my Chill as Art videos would be well aware of that. However, I went into this game with an open mind. Little did I know that the janitor's AI in normal mode is actually worse than in the higher difficulties, so I wasn't going to get the game's best experience from the offset. The janitors in this game basically function as a device to apply constant stress onto the player. Whenever you're making your way down a hall or searching a classroom, you'll need to be listening out for the recognisable jingling keys or whistle of the janitors. Thankfully, you can hear both from pretty far away, giving you enough time to hide or flank them. It's a good mechanic that, when done well, can heighten the horror experience to something above what other games can provide. There's a reason why I've played through Fatal Frame 2 several times, but cannot bring myself to finish Alien Isolation. It's just too stressful, and admittedly, I think that's an amazingly effective form of horror. However, this game falls short and the experience quickly becomes frustrating and sometimes downright confusing. The janitors seem extremely inconsistent to me for a start. At times they can spot you from the opposite end of a hall before you can even hear them or see the light from their torch. Other times I can be assumedly totally visible to them and they won't notice me. The latter rarely happen though as they're a little too good at locating me. It doesn't matter if I flee upstairs and hide in a random room, whipping my neck backwards to close all the doors behind me as I do so, because they'll still check the darkened, inconspicuous room I'm silently crouched in as if their spidey senses tingled and they could feel my presence in there. It just felt insulting to have effectively escaped from them by hiding in a random classroom only to have that be the first place they check once they get near. It was as if the game was blatantly telling me that the only place you're allowed to hide is the toilet stalls. Nothing else will work and don't even bother trying. So I stopped trying, which made the game all the more repetitive when I had to constantly return to the bathroom stalls to escape the janitor. I'd say a solid 25% of the footage I recorded for this video consisted of the inside of a bathroom stall while I waited sometimes upwards of a minute for an opportunity to leave and get where I needed to go. And like I mentioned earlier, he won't check any of the closed stalls, even if there's only one and no sign of the student he chased in there. His AI was so inconsistent that eventually I threw caution to the wind and started baiting him into rooms so that I could run out the other door and get around him. It's not exactly part of what I'd assume was the intended horror experience, but I did kind of enjoy briefly embracing the troublemaker attitude. The worst thing about the janitors though is that they can make progressing through the game such a slow and arduous task. The other thing that makes progress so difficult is this game's particular style of puzzles. White Day has an abundance of items to acquire throughout your playthrough, most of which are fairly innocuous objects you'd expect to find around any school. It's not unusual to use items in games to solve puzzles, but where I think White Day goes wrong, and this is totally down to the player's taste, is that it doesn't structure the discovery of the objects around the discovery of the puzzles properly. I prefer puzzles to be first presented to the player before they find the item or method to solve them. In other words, I like to see a locked door before finding its corresponding key and having that, oh, this key opens that door that I wanted to go through earlier, thought. Having it be the other way around feels unnatural and too convenient. White Day's puzzles are the equivalent of walking into a building and picking up a bunch of random items that you have no idea could possibly have any important use later, but then they do. Like, why would someone hold on to these items if their primary goal is to escape a school before getting murdered by a bat-wielding lunatic? And that's before I even get into the fact that amassing such a large collection of random items makes it incredibly difficult to figure out which ones can be used in what ways. In my Chill as Art videos, I talked about how Akamanto and Yukiona are incredibly frustrating experiences because 95% of your playtime is spent running away from a constantly pursuing enemy while trying to figure out which of the 15 random items you've collected can be used to solve an obscure puzzle so that you can progress to the next obscure puzzle. It's exactly the same issue here, and I just cannot find it within myself to find it enjoyable. During the first timed segment, I got so confused by all the random items I'd collected during it that I ran out of time and failed. In a moment where I had to follow a series of very specific steps, I was distracted by these random items that had absolutely nothing to do with the task at hand, and there was no indication that they were such. In my opinion, if you're going to give me lots of items and puzzles to solve with them, I need to also be given the time and freedom to do so. Having a time limit or a walking game over screen breathing down your neck while you're juggling between bits of trash trying to see which of them are actually useful is probably the worst way the puzzles could ever be done. A couple of my hour plus long play sessions were entirely spent on just trying to figure out how to progress. 
It's not that I was stuck on any puzzle in particular, but that I was stuck on several and didn't know how to solve any because they were so vague and unintuitive. This aspect of the game made the experience extremely frustrating for me, to a point where, when I often finally did solve a puzzle, there was no feeling of accomplishment or even relief, just a realisation that the random object I just acquired by solving it will be used to solve another obtuse puzzle later on. It's just exhausting. There was one moment in particular where I found a note that mentioned something about a weak squeaky floorboard in one of the hallways. I remembered that floorboard because I'd walked over it earlier and wondered why it in particular was squeaky. I returned to that spot and tried walking over it several times and to my genuine delight it collapsed and revealed an item underneath. My reward turned out to be one that related to a ghost story but I wasn't aware of that since it joined my collection of random objects that I had no idea what to do with. That moment was one of the very, very few in this game that I genuinely enjoyed and it was so short lived that it's almost depressing. White Day's visuals are, in my opinion, extremely flat. The game doesn't look bad per se, but the visual environments don't contribute to the horror atmosphere as much as I'd have liked. The school's interiors are coated with muted greys and browns that lack any depth that could possibly house unknown terrors within them. Maybe it's just because it's a modern, high resolution game that lacks the graphical impurities that give way to the horrors of the player's imagination, which I can't exactly penalise it for. But to me, if you're going to have a high resolution horror game, the environment should be detailed with elements that will help build an actual horror atmosphere, which the neutered, sanitised look of the school does not achieve for me. You can't just make a room dark and expect it to be scary. Horror isn't that simple. Home Sweet Home did a much better job of making its school's environment unsettling, and I know that was either an abandoned or nightmare version of the school, but it wouldn't take much effort to come up with a reason for White Day's school being a bit messed up. For instance, I just came up with this while writing the previous sentence. If the spirits repeatedly made a mess of the school at night, then the buildings could be littered with broken furniture and supplies, making the feeling of exploring them a little more anxiety inducing. Hell, this could even explain the janitor's rage when they catch you, being that they think it's all caused by trespassing students. So as for some things I think this game did right that I haven't already mentioned. The sound design immediately stood out to me because it constantly freaked me out. It did get a bit repetitive after a while because the same sound effects would play throughout the school, but at the very least the more subtle sounds did a good job of unsettling me. Oftentimes you'll hear a window rattle beside you as if some mischievous entity is banging on it from the outside. Random creaks and groans from the classrooms around you also do a great job of preventing you from relaxing. Their source is obviously from a natural part of the building you're in, but you're never quite sure if it's caused by supernatural means. The music, however, was not done right. And yeah, I know I'm supposed to be listing positives here, but shush. The music nearly always felt out of place, almost like they had a very limited library to pull from and didn't really care where they put any of it. I mean, what the fuck is this? The jump scares were done really well. They were sparse enough that they never came close to getting annoying or losing their effectiveness, and when they did happen I didn't feel cheated by the game, like they just appeared out of nowhere for no reason. My favourite jump scare was that of the lady in the locker, as her backstory and the reason she erupts out of the lockers is quite horrific but it perfectly justifies her appearance here. I honestly feel like this game could have had more, which is not an opinion I have often. I think there is definitely room for more within the general pacing of gameplay, and there are more than enough ghosts that could be utilised more. I did play on normal difficulty though, so maybe there are more scares on the higher ones. Some of the puzzles were theoretically quite cool, <laughs> and would have been more fun to solve if the gameplay wasn't so frustrating. They were all fairly well integrated into the school's environment, which is what I like to see in a game. There's nothing more immersion breaking than a puzzle that doesn't belong in its setting. And finally, that one corridor that loops endlessly so you can't return was quite cool. It's haunted by the fox spirit and she'll taunt you with nursery rhymes as you stumble through the darkness. You can also find some deep scratch marks in the wall that she left behind and inspecting them will anger her. I encountered her while trying to return to the old building from the new and I'm pretty sure you need a specific item to stop the hall from looping. It's cool, and definitely caught me by surprise when I first noticed that it was taking me unusually long to get to the end. White Day is a frustrating game for me. I'm aware that many people love this game, and hey, good for you, because I wish I did, but it's a type of game that I just can't enjoy. 
Its folklore and story are amazingly interesting, but the joy of experiencing them is almost completely ruined by the gameplay that does them no justice. The game has a certain level of jank, and many aspects, such as its puzzles and the janitor's AI, feel like they weren't playtested enough. It's not that the game feels unpolished, because I can't remember encountering a single bug or glitch. It just feels amateurish. Some, no, a lot of elements seem like no consideration was made for how the player would interact with them. Like they made perfect sense to the developers, but nobody else, and they never thought to get a second opinion. Which is strange, because this is a remake. They could have ironed out any issues the original game had. Well, maybe they did, and they just didn't notice these issues. To me, it feels like an early draft of a potentially great horror game. While it was a negative experience for me, it still has a collection of passionate fans that enjoy it for many of the reasons I had problems with, so I guess it must be doing something right. I'm happy this game has its fans, and I'm sure it'll find many more in the future, but having played it, I know that I'm not one of them, and that's okay. Oh, before I go, just a few things. Uh, I just discovered that there's a sequel to this game which was released earlier this year. It takes place once again at Yondu High School and consists of three episodes, each of which follow a different character as they experience the events of the story from their own perspective. This actually sounds pretty interesting, and it seems like they're really leaning into the multiple endings element, seeing as how you play in episode 2 may lead to a different ending when playing episode 1 again. I have no idea how that works, but I'm sure it'll make for an interesting experience. If you'd like to see me play White Day 2, let me know and I'll see what I can do. Other than that, I'd like to give a genuine thanks to everyone who stayed around during my break during YouTube. The main reason I left was to focus on my final year college project, as I was entering the last few months and really couldn't afford to dedicate time to anything else. That project was actually a comic that you can read as soon as this video ends, and I'll leave a link in the description for anyone interested. I've received a lot of positive feedback and would love to hear what more people think of it. The second reason I left was because making videos was becoming kind of a chore for me. When I write, I can't help but go very into detail with everything. It's kind of just how my brain operates. This often resulted in spending ages describing a scene that would probably take others 20 seconds to do so. I began to hate the writing process because it felt so laborious, so when I returned I wanted to try going less in depth while focusing on the more important elements. This approach made writing the script a lot more enjoyable and I hope I struck a nice balance between analysing enough and keeping this video entertaining. I also fully expected to bleed subscribers as people lost interest in my dormant channel, but was surprised to see that it actually slowly grew over the months. When I left I was at 800 subs, and now I'm close to 1000. It really means a lot to me that people give enough of a shit about what I have to say to stick around even when I'm not posting, so thank you. I do have a few new things planned for the channel that I came up with while I was away, one of which may be the next video I release, we'll see how that goes. As for how often I'll be uploading, that's still hard to say. I'm still trying to find my footing after finishing college, and the amount of time I can spend on making videos changes wildly from week to week. As for comics, if anybody cares, I released Chapter 2 of Blood Orange recently, but will be taking a break from it to work on a possibly new comic that revolves around a member of the Yakuza. It's very inspired by Yakuza films from the 70s and 80s, so if that's your jam, keep an eye out for it. But other than that, thanks for watching.